Welcome everybody. We're just going to slowly um, allow for people to join and then we will get started in a moment. Lots of familiar names here. It's like a LinkedIn reunion. People that we know. You'll note that as you join the session today, that, uh, so just so that you're aware before we begin our conversations today. So let's get started. Welcome everybody. My name is Associate Professor Sarah Wayland. I'm from the University of New England. To be a really long of opportunities to speak to people in the community, researchers, students, interested people, people with lived experience, clinicians and practitioners about the conversations that need to happen uh, from a regional mental health perspective. So welcome everybody. I'd also like to welcome those that are going to be listening to the recording um, after the live session and we hope that you have an opportunity to reflect on the same rich learnings that we hope to have here today together. Before I begin, I just wanted to um, acknowledge of Country and really indicate that Manor Institute respectfully acknowledges the First Nations custodians of this continent that we're on, that we pay our respect to Elders past, present and emerging, and that the Institute honours the rich cultural heritage, beliefs and enduring relationship to the lands and communities in which we all live and learn and work. I'm really proud to come to you today from Ngunnawal country. I'm down in Canberra after attending the Suicide Prevention Australia breakfast at Parliament House this morning to acknowledge World Suicide Prevention Day this Sunday. What was at the core of the breakfast this morning, other than scones and coffee, um, was an opportunity to hear very much from lived experience perspectives about challenging our ideas that suicide only happens within a mental health context. And finally, recognising the fact that both politicians, service providers, people with lived experience and community members need to recognise the impact of the ways in which we live and how that enhances people's distress and how we need to come together in a community of practice to better respond to individuals. So for those of you that might be coming to an event at Manor Institute for the first time, I'll just provide a really short overview about what Manor Institute is. Now, Manor Institute was formed uh, about 18 months ago now um, in response to the need to take ownership of the mental health and wellbeing of members in regional, rural and remote Australia. Our goal is to build capacity and to implement solutions for priority populations. There's been a lot of conversations lately about, well, it, isn't everybody a priority? And I think that there's a slow move towards removing the idea of priority populations and recognising that there will be individuals, groups and communities who are in need that we need to better respond to. The Institute is part of an initial three year strategy to improve mental health and wellbeing in those rural, regional and remote Australian communities. And think about the ways that we can foster meaningful research, thinking about the development of our professional health workforces and really closing that gap in terms of translating research findings back into practical place based programs. There's so much alliteration in everything that we're talking about, but it's very, very difficult to make sure that you get it out there so that people understand. Manor Institute itself doesn't technically exist as a building. It's a virtual institute that brings together leading mental health researchers from seven universities across the regional universities network that's better known as RUN. That's Charles Sturt Uni, Central Queensland, <clears throat> University Federation, University of Southern Cross, University of Southern Queensland, University of Sunshine Coast, and the lead institution where I currently sit as acting head of school, the University of New England. We also want to extend our gratitude to the collaboration that we have with industry and community partners, which include EveryMind, Lifeline Direct, and ANU Centre for Mental Health Research. 
we were really about tailoring solutions that are specific to regional Australia, not metrocentric, that we eventually refer backwards to those communities. The topic that we're talking about today is co-design. I have long been a massive advocate of co-design. I am a social worker by trade. Everything that I do is going to be informed by my connections with others. I initially worked in the disability sector where very much the baseline there is about nothing about us without us. It's about recognising that lived experience inclusion is not an afterthought, but a key foundational opportunity of bringing people together to make sure that there's opportunities to share experiences. Because at the core of co-design is participatory action. We want to make sure that people are together to explore solutions that actually relate to them. In the mental health and suicide prevention space, this approach is about truly considering whose voices are given priority but also making sure that we recognise who we're not inviting to the table, who we're not listening out for, whose voices are not represented in our research. <clears throat> and thinking about if we don't have those voices, how do we design interventions and approaches? <coughs> Sorry, I've been talking a lot this morning and my voice is already going. What I'd like to do to begin is to ask you to share in the chat what your working definition of co-design is. So I'd like you to do that now. Occupational hazard of being a big speaker. So I'd love you to share your reflections on what does co-design actually mean for you? Our first speaker is going to be Tracy Colbay Alexander. Tracy is a professional public health expert, who's a professor and associate head of school research at the University of Southern Queensland. Her main research focus is the role of health seeking behaviours on health and wellbeing in communities, including those with low socioeconomic status. She also focuses on the needs of regional and remote areas and the global south. Tracy has substantial experience in community-based participatory research methods. She works from a citizen science perspective and her goal is to address health and equity outcomes. Tracy has established really strong links with various communities and organisations in West Morton and the Darling Down regions. She's leading two programs for work for the Safer Toowoomba Regional Partnerships Obesity Prevention Focus Group and is also a member of Toowoomba's Regional Council's um, Regional Active and Public Transport Advisory Committee. It's like she's decided to take every word in the universe and merge them together in terms of the work that she's doing. She's also a physical activity expert consultant for the World Health Organization. And today we're going to hear from her where she's going to focus on how you can define co-design, how you apply it in a research setting and what lessons she has learned in that practice. We also have some key papers that she's published in this area that I'll share in the chat as she's talking. But for now, I'd like to hand over to Tracy and we'd love to hear from her. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks, Sarah. Good morning, everybody. And um, I'm joining you from Yanjin, Brisbane. And um, I would like to acknowledge the Yagada and Jagada peoples as the traditional owners of the lands we are on today. Um, and I've made some notes, so when I look down, it's so that I keep to time. And Sarah, if I go over time, kind of just wave your arms madly. <laughs> um, I would like to start off by saying what co-design isn't. It, it's not designing at people, and it's not designing for people. So for me, coming as what I would call an ac academic practitioner, because I've worked in practice as well, is it's not about in physical activity, for example, me thinking, oh, I think this intervention would be really good. Let me just do some focus groups with the community that I'm um, hoping to um, encourage in this intervention, or let me do some key informant um, interviews and see what they think of this intervention. That is not co-design. That is simply qualitative research where you're getting their perspectives. It's not even when we do, and I've done this in the past many times um, before I really knew what co-design was, where I would 
have some focus groups with the community. Let's just say this would be high school students trying to find out what kind of activities they enjoy, what kind of interventions they might like to have, how they think we should implement it. So all the things we would imagine is in co-design, but really the reason it's not co-design is because I was taking their feedback, their opinions and their perspectives to use it to design a program eventually on my own or with research collaborators and then implement it. What co-design is, it's where we are working with the people. So we are producing something together. And when you look at the words co-design, co means that collaboration, that togetherness. And I try to read some of the things in the chat beforehand, but I can't multitask. But I see someone mention pulling in stakeholders at the get-go. And that certainly is part of the co-design, where we bring in everyone that might be affected or have a story to tell or influence things from the beginning. So it's even about them setting the agenda. What is it that we're going to target? What is it that we're going to address? So I, what I thought about is, because I was only given seven minutes <laughs> and um, you know we could do a, a two hour workshop on, on co-design and co-development. What I thought about is just um, giving a few touch points on deciding whether this is or isn't co-design. And a lot of my references has come from the book Beyond Sticky Notes. Um, so just to acknowledge that. So the first thing is, are we making something? Because it's not just about getting opinions. Co-designers means that everyone involved actually makes a decision. We actually develop something. We're actually producing something. Um, so yeah, that's the first question. It's not just about having meetings, getting feedback, doing some thematic analysis. It's really about the decision making. So again, coming back to the example of physical activity, it could be, so are we going to focus on having a walking program? And it might be that someone says, yes, um, you know, we want to have a walking program, but we only want to have it indoors because it's really hot in the sun. And that's someone with a lived experience from, from that um, community that might have that. And I think that's, that's the other thing is when you're looking at are we making something is have you included all the people that have that should have a voice? So this is people with a lived experience, people with a community, people that may have done some similar things in the past. It doesn't mean that as academics, we need to get rid of evidence, but it certainly does mean that we're going to involve all that might be affected in discussions and decision-making. So with that, when we are looking at the co-design process, one of the other questions that we should ask ourselves is, are non-designers in de designing what we want? So is everybody given an opportunity to contribute? And how extensive has your co-design process been? You know, if you're just um, interviewing or including four people, is that truly co-design? How much of the community has been represented? And then the other thing is, are we learning to together? Are we working together? Or sometimes are we working towards working together? Because when we're bringing in different people and all our designers and everyone to work on a project, it might be that the first instance is building trust and getting to know each other. And in some cases, building trust takes as long as it takes. And so even hospitality is part of co-design, just having a cup of coffee with someone, getting to know where they come from, what's their story, how they feel and can they be contributing to the process? What would they like out of the process? So that might be part of the working towards working together. Sometimes inadvertently, we might bring parties together around the same table or having a yarning circle, but it might have been one person that didn't want to work with another person in another setting, and we didn't know that. So how do we get that set up so people are willing and feel trusted and safe to share and contribute? The other thing is to, to ask ourselves is, um, are the co-designers being recognized for their time? And what I'm starting to see, particularly in academ academia, where we need to show co-design, and one of the things is, well, your consumers or your, your co-investigators um, 
should be paid. And then sometimes we think, well, if we pay them, it means they're co-designers and that's recognition. That's not good enough. Um, we need to find out what's the currency. What does it mean? Because not everyone wants to be paid for their time. The recognition might be something else. Um, so when we're working with our group, and I don't even like the name stakeholders. I, I, I just like to call them our friends. But when we're working with our group of friends, figure out what is it that means something to them in terms of recognition and how how you can show the value of their contribution to the product that you, you're busy producing or co-producing or co-production. So we do need to ask people what co-design means to them. I've just realized I can't see Sarah. And the other thing is, are the co-designers getting something out of this? What, what is the benefit for them? And I've seen, um, you know, there's various consumer groups and we can approach consumers and these groups to um, help us involve the community and consumers in the co-design process. But it could be that we have some professional consumers and their voices might dominate the voice of other community members. And how do we negotiate that? And how do we manage that? Or it might be that, um, in one of the projects we've done where someone was very willing to be part of it, but she felt quite intimidated by the group despite the group being her peers. And so we involved her family to come along with it just for her to feel supported in, in, in having a voice and raising a voice. So um, I'm not sure how I'm doing um, on time, but I think what we wanna, do I still have more time or am I? No, oh, <laughs> I can't read this Sorry, my um. My sign language is um, ambiguous. Two more minutes. Um, and I also wanted to say um, I'm taking lots of notes because I think that there's some really cool questions that um, we'll be able to ask at the end. But if people want to pop their note, their questions in the chat and then we can loop back around for a collaborative discussion at the end. So keep going, Tracy. Thanks. Thanks. And and I think for me, what I feel very strongly about and I and I openly declare it's my history, it's my bias, it's where I grew up. I grew up in a different country to this, but it's about building capacity and empowering communities. Um, my proudest achievement um, as an academic is that one of the interventions we developed, um, uh, I'm from Cape Town, in Cape Town, was scaled up to nearly 40 communities. And of those, about 15 of them are still going more than 20 years later. But I think the reason it's going is because we built capacity and we, and we, we transferred ownership of the intervention or the program that we had to the community and they shaped it according to the way they needed to, to do that um, or, or keep the program going. The other thing I just want to touch on, because um, I think Sarah asked me to, is um, I've been doing a lot of work with citizen science. And in the citizen science projects that I'm doing, um, the citizen scientists collect the data, but they also analyze the data. And um, as an academic, it's the toughest thing for me because I literally sit on my hands or put my hands in my pockets and have various physical cues to make sure that I keep quiet because it's their voices, not mine. Um, but even in that citizen science project that we've just completed in Toowoomba, it's not actually co-design in the true sense because we've made decisions, they've shown what they can advocate for, but the next step would be to build on the relationships that we've established in that citizen science project and then working together with them to now, in South African terms, concretize those things and put those ideas into action and figure out how we can take what they've suggested and um, create various programs. In this case, it was to get people to walk more for active transport. So, Sarah, I hope I've met the brief um, and I'm happy to take questions. And I see you put the link to um, more than sticky notes in the chat. And that's that was where I just went all the time when I started. It's a fantastic resource. Thank you, Tracy. I, I think um, I'm going to use the South African term if it's appropriate from now on about concretize. Um, different um, ideas about ways of moving forwards. And I think Di picked up on you know, a similar question that I was um, pondering while you were talking about, you know, at the core of this, we're often talking about definitions of the ways in which we work, but then we have to interrogate the definitions that we use and see where those ideas come from and whether or not they match with what we're thinking. 
I think Di's point around um, managing dominance, managing recognition, um, is that we need to understand and co-design the idea of what does recognition actually mean for lived experience. I've had a lot of conversations with people about, um, you know, some feeling that gift cards are quite tokenistic to people, exactly. other people appreciate them. Um, some people find um, that that validates their work for tax purposes. They like to be paid in certain ways. But you will only know that if you ask it. If you ask, we recognise the invaluable contribution you can make, but how can we recognise your contribution for you? So I think there's lots of ideas that are swirling around. Exactly. So thank you, Tracy. Yeah, Sorry, and I just you got... wanted to point at the, the tokenism of sometimes putting in a a little bit of a gift voucher, a little bit of money, yeah. almost going, okay, so I've done it. And and even the value that we attach to that, is it just what our budget can handle? That's not how it should work. It should be from the start. And and the whole thing is, and I will promise to be quiet after this, but it's 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 not silencing your voice. It's just softening your voice and allowing yourself to listen more and ask more and not assume. I think that um, something I'd love to come back to at the end about like how do researchers challenge their bias that it's not from the evidence base with lived experience inclusion. I think that that's a constant conversation that we need to be having. So thank you, Tracy. I'd now like to introduce Shannon Colbert. So Shannon's going to reflect on some examples of collaboration with people with lived experience and researchers and why co-design can um, be the key to better outcomes. Now, Shannon is an independent lived experience specialist. She's got, a, she's got a, a long experience of working across several national government and non-government organisations in an advisory capacity. And that can be in relation to complex systems. She also works in eating disorders, mental health, suicide prevention and palliative care. I think naming that recognises that lived experience inclusion is about intersectionality that we are not just a checkbox of an inclusion, that people are multifaceted and they come with multiple lived and learnt experiences. As an educator, Shannon has trained and supported multidisciplinary teams and organisations on trauma-informed treatment interventions. She works with the lived experience setting lived experience in co-design policy research and education. So welcome, Shannon, and I welcome any um, questions in the chat as we move forward. Uh, look, thanks so much, um, Sarah, and also thank you um, for this lovely opportunity to to meet it and speak with you all. I just want to acknowledge that I'm um, here from Wajak Nongabuja, which is in Perth, Western Australia. Um, look, I think this is uh, such a rich conversation, and to be honest, I I think I just value the the the, the privilege of having conversations, especially in this 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 topic that can sometimes be overcomplicated, um, is fundamental to how we actually do the work that we do, whether it's in research or service delivery and service design. But I think most importantly, it's kind of walking into this gray of what co-design may mean and look like together. Um, so, so yes, I sort of have worked across complex systems, um, but very much has been based on um, having lived experience and a very sort of long and enduring lived experience across these different um, complex areas. Um, but I think in terms of where I bring uh, a lived experience expertise into that space now is um, I'd argue that I hardly ever talk about my own lived experience, but actually support in partnership with teams and organizations, um, ways in which we um, collectively work with not only people in the community, but actually bring people into um, these relationships that that will look like, um, that will actually establish um, a, a community of practice really, so to speak, and also a collaboration that's authentic and transparent. Um, look, Tracy's touched on some fundamental and critical points, and I, I can't reiterate enough on the research on sticky notes. Um, I also want to acknowledge that from a research context as well, there is so much information that's out there, um, and, and sometimes it can be overwhelming. And I think that there are different um, pieces of resources and, and sort of the way, where do we go with all of that? Um, and, and sort of which are the particular pieces of research to utilize. And this is why this particular conversation is so helpful because, um, you know, Tracy's has, has found one that she's found incredibly, 
incredibly helpful. And I would encourage you utilize those options, especially if you're coming from an academia space. Um, I guess there are so many different examples about um, good co-design and um, times where we've called it co-design, but it really hasn't been co-design. And I think it is okay at times to say that we don't necessarily do it perfectly. This isn't about getting it right. And that is very challenging for many of us, um, you know, especially when sometimes the world may look, um, they may need to be black and white, that we need results now, or we need something to be done perfectly, or the outcomes need to be um, to show a perfect example or a perfect outcome. But the reality is, is our community is consistently changing. Our experiences in life are, you know, continue to change and emerge. Our world is changing and our community is changing and shifting. And so when we talk about what do we need moving forward, that's an evolving process. And I sometimes reflect on co-design as this evolving blueprint that sometimes we have to walk through collectively and together. And that's a challenge when we actually say, well, we don't know what the end result is, but it's also really important when we're transparent collectively about the reality that we will need to sort of sometimes work through this together and to determine um, what those outcomes may look like. I think what is most important for people with lived experience, and this is whether it comes to co-design in research or even in um, service design, is that it's fundamental to ensure that the conditions of trust really are built before anything kicks off. Um, and I think those conditions are fundamental to how we work together and collectively in partnership. And that's not only just with people with lived experience, but that may be people that are participating in your research, people that are a part of your team, and even within yourselves as, as a team in terms of, okay, well, what is this going to look like and what do we need to establish? What is it that we may need to call out and how can we have these transparent conversations um, in, in when things may not uh, turn out the way that we had hoped, considering that there isn't any predictability to co-design, that it is a process that is evolves uniquely for each and every different project or process. Um, where I think people with lived experience struggle with the trust deficit is when there's organizations or processes that are already saying, oh, we do co-design, or we do co-design perfectly, or this, this, this process was co-designed and they can't necessarily talk to what that process is included. And if we can't establish the fundamental principles of co-design, then really it isn't that. And it is okay at times to say that we can't do co-design. Co-design can't be across everything, but I think that importance and honesty is fundamental to us. Sometimes you can still do really good consultation, but be really honest and transparent about that as well. So yes, it is important to understand the descriptions and the understanding of what co-design is, but I think a really great starting point is when you're determining whether it's a piece in research or whether it's potentially um, involving people from the community or doing some form of service design, is establishing collectively what those principles of co-design are. Because there's a shared understanding then of how collectively you can walk through that process together. I talk about the walking through a process, and I think this is where sometimes co-design has gone amiss, is we start off really well, but the most important part is that whole journey, that whole um, process of actually taking people along that process and taking them through that experience as well. So a lot of times, whether it's in research or whether it's in um, a particular project, people have been brought in potentially from the beginning but if I even reflect on my own experiences, there's been so many times where I participated in a workshop or a piece of research and I couldn't tell you what the outcomes were. I couldn't tell you what the end result was. And I think there was a point of walking into this process feeling really enthusiastic and included and encouraged, but then going, and what now? And what from here? And so sometimes if you look at it, you look at um, where, you know, what do people actually in the community potentially want when they're participating um, in or partnering alongside? And I think it's being really clear about what is it that people are needing first and foremost. We will learn so much from our community 
that we have no understanding of unless we actually hear from them and we hear from their voices and experience. And I think it's also then really important to determine what we mean by diversity and intersectionality as well, which um, you know Sarah sort of um, touched on as well. The reality is people are wonderfully unique um, and many have coexisting and co-occurring challenges, you know, whether it's with mental health, whether it's suicidality, whether it's with deep grief, um, whether it's with, um, you know, not being able to access any form of supports or if it's with disability. We look at people from the LGBTIQ communities and we look at our Aborig Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities as well. Fundamentally, I think it's actually asking the community that you are um, wanting to work alongside, what is it that they need and what is it that we're potentially missing in the process? There is wonderful opportunity with lived experience advisors and educate to support what establishing um, lived experience advisory groups would look like in a co-design um, process, which is a great way to really model what partnership looks like. It is challenging to sort of understand the broader context of lived experience engagement and involvement. And a lot of times we get this sort of blurred understanding where a person is a researcher who has lived experience and then all of a sudden is it that the expectation that there is if they're meant to prioritize those two those two roles and responsibilities or is it having a clinician with lived experience or is it having um, a person who's actually from the community that has no understanding of academia but really has a good robust understanding of what the community and peers need and so these are the, the wonderful ways that you can start to explore, okay, well, what are the outcomes that we're hoping to achieve? I think the great opportunity of actually working and partnering authentically and transparently with people with lived and living experience is eventually when we do reach the outcomes, we know then that it has come from the salt of the earth in terms of the people that are needing to actually utilize, um, whether it's a service or actually improve their quality of life, especially in the context of research. So if we authentically partner with people that live lived experience and they are sharing their knowledge and expertise alongside you as potentially as a researcher, can you imagine if they're helping to support enriching what your process of research may look like? So if you have lived experience um, sort of guide your co-design process in particular with research, then you start to explore, okay, you actually start to bring people into contributing and participating in that research. If you've had lived experience guide what that process looks like, can you imagine that transparency and authenticity that people will actually bring into that research process in terms of what they are actually feeding back? Because you're already starting to build a trusting relationship because you've thoughtfully considered, well, what are the ways in which people want to bring their best selves into that process? And it's those outcomes that are fundamental at the end of the day, especially in the context of research. Because where people bring their expertise into, into a process of conversation, of transparency, they will bring their honesty to you. They will bring their, their self-determination and their dignity of risk. And they will know that it's a trusting space to do exactly that. And those are the rich, that's the rich story that you need to hear to actually determine, well, what are the next steps moving forward? And even where we, we have outcomes that aren't ideal, um, outcomes that may not have that perfect result, that is, a, that is also in itself a critical learning for us. You know, when something isn't a, a perfect outcome, it's also really important to actually understand then how do we change direction and do things differently. I want to just also acknowledge in the context of academia, the complexities. Um, and even when you think of, um, you know, some pressures in terms of grant funding, or you even think about service design, people say, well, we want you to co-design a process, but we want it tomorrow. Um, and so I think there tends to be this real pressure, sometimes even from government and, and government obviously understand, and just to acknowledge the pressures on them as well, the pushback and the challenge for us is actually leaning into that discomfort and actually constantly advocating that if we do this, we have to do it authentically. And that's really difficult because I know sometimes there are expectations, but if something is being asked of you and you don't feel that you can do it authentically, then I think your courage and your wisdom and, and the way you will shift people's thinking is when you push back from that and explain why. 
And it's a hard ask because sometimes I know there's always a risk of, of having some form of letdown or being turned away. But I think if we if we exacerbate a trust deficit with our community, then unfortunately the ripple effect of that is more is more detrimental to all of us, really. And so I think what we can do though is start to shift um, our broader understandings, especially from an organizational level. I was doing a, a co-design workshop with a great group of researchers and they acknowledged the challenges in terms of their own funding when implementing a research project and, and how do we actually support then people with lived experience and value, value them for their time and contribution. And I recognize that actually, especially when there are so many limitations. I think what we can start to do though is, a, is go to our organizations and go to our leads and start to shift that thinking and conversation and then start to actually have these courageous conversations around why it's so important. So fundamentally, if we can't do it, we need to actually explain why we can't not do it. And, um, and yeah, and I just wanted to touch on that. And I've probably gone way over, haven't I, Sarah? I was only nearly... by three minutes and I really held oh, on to it to not like jump in. So I could talk no... about the cars come home. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I'll no, hash no, it out. Yes, we'll, we'll have I a I think that we're having some lovely conversations in the, um, in the chat just about what a rewarding conversation it is to talk about, you know, for, for what really jumps out for me is the, the, you start off with great intentions and they often fall away. And those competing demands of grants and timelines and outcomes and evaluations means that the partnership ideal is often lost along that way. Di talks about the fact that what would be ideal is recognising that researchers are experts in the process and participants are subject matter experts. And I do agree with that, but I think that there is also a blending together of people who work in both spaces that have both research expertise and lived experience expertise and really being open to building that whole idea of what it means to collaborate. So I think what's been really perfect here is that we've actually set up the speakers unintentionally in a way that they've all finished off starting with the starting point of the next speaker. And the reason why I can say this with great clarity is that our next speaker is Dr. Tanya Pierce. Tanya is an interdisciplinary lecturer in the Faculty of Medicine and Health at the University of New England. And I was very proud to be one of Tanya's uh, PhD supervisors. And her PhD study that she graduated from earlier this year was about looking at youth cooperation to research capacity for third sector organisations. Now, before she started her PhD, um, Tanya has been very lucky to be working with both myself and Professor Miff Maple for the last few years as a research assistant. Um, and also worked with the Collaborative Research Network, which was the CRN for Regional Mental Health and Wellbeing. Now, um, Tanya's PhD focused not just on co-creation, but utilising a case study approach to better understand the role of collaboration between Lifeline Midcoast, Lifeline Research Foundation and UNE. So she's going to touch on what she learnt in her PhD but I think one of the key papers that I loved from her study was around whether or not it's good fortune or good management that leads to good co-creation relationships. I'm going to hand over to Tanya and she will um, round off our conversation today. Then we'll stop the recording and we can have a collaborative discussion before we finish up at one. So over to you, Tanya. Thanks so much, Sarah, and thanks so much for um, inviting me to speak today. I'm very excited. And interestingly, we're all from different organisations and different backgrounds, and yet we, we share very similar um, perspectives and viewpoints about what code design is and isn't, So, um, which is pleasing. Otherwise, it, it could have been a bit of a punch-up. But um, the um, I guess just to start, and I just want to touch quickly on the terminology and the problems that we have with it. When I did my first paper for my PhD, because I published, um, did a PhD by publication, it was on trying to unravel what we mean by these co-words. 
And initially um, at that time, and I think it was back in about 2017, 2020 got published, but um, trying to identify all those co-words, they just, people were starting to make them up. And there was such an overlap between, you know, what someone meant by co-design and what someone meant by co-creation um, that it was really difficult to untangle. And I think it's important to, not necessarily because I recognize the importance of evolving and developing um, the space, but it's also important to try and just not make up words and go, well, it doesn't fit in co-design, so let's just call it co-planning. Um, because then it's really hard as researchers, if you're doing systematic reviews or scoping reviews, to then to be able to identify those papers and and whether we're all looking at the same thing or we're not. Um, so I just wanted to, to point on that but also plug for my definitions paper, which is awesome. Um, and within that paper, um, we came to see co-creation as sort of like the broader um, term that encompassed the research process and co-design was the second stage of that. So we had co-ideation, co-design, co-implementation and co-evaluation. And so the idea was all along that research process, um, people would be participating. Now, for instance, if you just did co-design without the other three, then it would just be called co-design. You wouldn't then rename it and call it co-creation. Um, so it had to contain all of those um, four elements. And the other um, point of difference, I think that's important for us to, while we recognise the um, importance of including the stakeholders, um, and lived experience in that process. And, and that essentially what was my PhD was about increasing the research capacity of, of third sector organisations, um, was the fact that we also had to recognise we needed, you know, the evidence that we were going to produce to make sure that it was valid and reliable. Um, so in some ways we, we do take um, control of the analysis um, uh, so to speak, but in doing so, that analysis is then open to feedback um, and engagement with the, um, I won't call them stakeholders, I'll call them friends, um, with our friends to go through that and see whether that's consistent with what they've seen. So just to quickly um, go over to the applied case study, which was my fourth paper, um, we did the co-creation process through all of that. It took quite a lot of time. And it certainly, as, as the other speakers have alluded to, it's not an easy process. It's messy. It's non-linear. Um, but, you know, the whole aim is to try and eliminate that gap between research and practice, essentially. Um, so in our study, co-design was really about... Um, co-designing the program or, you know, it could also be a policy, but also co-designing the research methods that we were going to um, adopt. So, uh, spe and specific examples in that, and there weren't, you know, grid, big, grand um, sort of ideas, but it was even came down to how do we make those communication processes work for both of us? So, you know, academics are very busy with lots of incoming um, information. Um, our friends were in Port Macquarie and so therefore remote from us. How do we do that? How do we um, consistently communicate so it works for everyone? And the other um, way that we did a lot of co-designing was around the data collection processes. So, um, that was the other way that was integrated. Otherwise, they were there throughout the whole process as well. Um, I think some of, and some of the the themes that came out of that they were there was about the language of co-design, how that was perceived by different groups. It took a long time for the our friends to um, understand. Uh, the research process, even though they had an idea of it, but just even understanding that so we were sharing the same language um, and the trust was um, integral to our relationship. So we went through, you know, like any relationship really, went through some bumpy, challenging times together, but then we went through some incredibly, you know, growth periods where um, they were able to go, oh, my gosh, I can see now the power of data, what that can do for our program, what that can do for our um, participants, and also some of the value-added opportunities that co-creation brought as well. Um, but some of, yeah, some of the other challenges 
um, really brought home the need for consistent and open communication. And I think that's the thing and, and what the other speakers were saying too is that there's all this idea about co-designing and that it's going to be quite easy and streamlined. Um, but, you know, like any human relationship, it's going to be difficult and people are going to be like protecting their areas and like, you know, I've got views on that. So why aren't you validating what I've got to say? And so it's all really trying to um, pull that together. I think one of the factors um, that we identified in our study that was particularly helpful was having previous relationships to that whole co-design, co-creation process. So because we had already established trust, um, my supervisors had already established, already established trust with that organisation and with the people working in it, that certainly helped to grow and develop our and streamline our working together much more than if we'd come in fresh like we were, you know, starting the first date. Um, and so, it, you know, really, I think from here we can go on to um, really look at integrating the um, perhaps participants into that process as well and what they um, can bring to the table because it's really about sharing that um, expertise and power, validating it so it doesn't become um, tokenistic and making sure that there's the opportunity there to um, share knowledge and shape and influence the delivery of services. Thank you. Thanks, Tan. I think that um, that point that Tanya made about um, pre-existing relationships um, means that uh, it's not always about reaching out to your friends <laughs> or the people that you know in the sector, but fostering good relationships over time where your first connection with a service, with a group of people, with individuals, it's not just based on, hey, I'm applying for this grant or, hey, I want to evaluate this project would you like to help me out? But developing those core relationships and then seeing where the opportunities come over time. I think that it requires uh, some research of vulnerability, exactly what Tracy said about recognizing that the evidence base can be enhanced by inclusion of all people. Um, and also making sure that we do not minimize voices just because those voices might say things that we don't want to hear. So I think that there's lots of opportunities there. What we're going to do now is um, pause, uh, stop the recording and then open up the floor because um, we've all spoken a lot 